Penn State fans, it's time for another installment of the Blue White Breakdown podcast from Penn Live. And we, as promised, we have a special guest uh, on this episode. Bob Flounders joined by David Jones. And uh, it's our pleasure to welcome, uh, to welcome in Aaron McCann of MLive.com. Aaron covers the Michigan Wolverines, who will be visiting State College around noon on Saturday. Jim Harbaugh and those guys, one of the better teams in the country, top 10 team, uh, showdown game in the Big Ten East. Uh, Aaron, welcome uh, welcome to the podcast, and I'm looking forward to doing one with you for MLive.com a little bit later in the week as well. Yeah, guys, thanks for having me. It's uh, you know, it, big matchup Saturday. I think for both teams for maybe different reasons. Uh, but it's you know, I'm looking forward to it. It's always Aaron, a fun uh, trip to State College. Aaron, <laughs> he's just gonna yell at you. Yes, he's gonna I'm yell here. questions at you. Okay, don't screw this up. <laughs> that's the that's the goal, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm curious right off the bat about one thing. Do you think? Uh, Jim Harbaugh is going to try to play bully ball right away and Josh Gaddis and see if they can, if they can run the ball and keep running the ball and gum this game to death, uh, 19 to 10. That that's kind of been their MO all season long. Uh, from the very beginning, they tried establishing the run. They, they tried showing that they, that they could run the football. I, I think part of that was, you know, by design, you know, that they had a first year quarterback, Cade McNamara, uh, you know, he's, he's only had a handful of starts now in his career. They had a receivers room there. I don't think they necessarily knew what they were going to get. Um, but yeah, I certainly think that's going to be the case. Um, now, the one crutch of that is is they may be without one of their top their top running backs in, in Blake Corum. You know, he, he went out of the game last week, um, you know, due to injury, didn't come back. His status this week remains unclear. The coaches haven't really said whether or not he's practicing or he's going to play. Um, you know, I suspect he's going to try and give it a go. Um, but Blake Corm is one of those guys who's he's very shifty. And, and if there's any pain, I, I don't think he's going to play. So, I, I, yeah, I, I, to answer your question, yes, they're going to try and run the football. That's been their identity all season long. I don't think they're going to get away from that, even with a, a running back in question. Um, it, but whether or not they're able to do it early is going to depend on, you know, is, is going to determine whether or not they're going to throw the ball a ton. Yeah, yeah to, to me, Corum. Quorum is a little bit outside the box for a for a Michigan running back. Haskins, totally like your typical Michigan running back. Uh, Mr. Inside, sticks his head in the A-gap. Quorum gives you a, a Mr. Outside kind of guy who's really shifty, really, really um, shifty at full speed, which they, they really hadn't had a lot of, and they don't have anybody else like him, do they? No, and Corum was a a Josh Gaddis recruit. For, for your listeners who aren't familiar, Josh Gaddis is their their Michigan's offensive coordinator who who came in a couple of years ago. He he kind of brought in this quote unquote speed and space offense. He kept talking about it, it was kind of a mesh of it, of their Jim Harbaugh's pro style scheme with more of a West Coast you know spread style flair. Um, and, and so he's he's a product of Josh Gaddis. He's kind of what Josh envisioned this offense to eventually be. Um, you know, he saw some snaps last year, didn't play a ton, but they liked what they saw and what they kind of felt like they had with him. And then and they've used him and him and Hassan to kind of their advantage. You're absolutely right. You know, Blake is very much that quick, sh shifty, uh, you know, guy that can get outside the tackles and break and break you know long runs, whereas Hassan's more in between the tackles goals kind of embodies that old school Jim Harbaugh style offense so they've worked each you know they worked both of them kind of off each other and very productively um and it's it's kind of made a you know people want to point to this Michigan offense and say well this is what Jim Harbaugh you know this is classic Jim Harbaugh and while that necessarily is true um there's there's different facets of it and, and Blake Corum is a big part of that he offers yeah. something different in the run game and not only that but he can catch passes out of the backfield and, and make you know defenders yeah miss. To, to me then now now let me ask you this from afar Dave you know I'm on this podcast right yeah I know I know but okay. I, I've got questions so I'm gonna ask them uh, I'm really curious about these things uh, to, from I'm going to take the next one, Aaron. Don't worry. From afar, it looks to me as if <laughs> Bo Schembechler is running this offense from uh, from above, that that the longer a season goes on, the more Jim Harbaugh regresses and probably kind of takes over for Josh Gannis. How intrusive is he into play calling? That, that's a good question and not something we've gotten a clear answer on. You know, we, we have asked and it sounds like this is still Josh Gaddis making the play calls. 
Um, but you're right. This is absolutely embodies what Jim Harbaugh wants wants to play. And I, I think you got to take a step back and realize, you know, with this, the situation Michigan and Jim Harbaugh find themselves in. Jim Harbaugh took a pay cut last offseason. Yes, he had an extension, but I think the pressure is on him to win football games. And when Jim Harbaugh needs to win football games, <laughs> what does he do? He reverts back to what he knows best. And, and I think that's been the, very much the situation this year with Michigan so far. Um, you, you aren't seeing the ton of that, that, that speed and space stuff I was talking about earlier that Josh Gaddis wanted to, to, to run. It's very much been what Jim Harbaugh wants. Now, I think Josh Gaddis is still making the bulk of the play calls, but there are more cooks in that kitchen that, this year. They promoted oh boy, um, oh tight ends boy. coach to oh co-offensive boy. coordinator. Yeah. He's kind of, you know, he's kind of yeah. taken over, helped with the run game. And it certainly, it cer- certainly is more of a, a Jim Harbaugh-esque offense. That's what all, we're all right, Bob. Go to it, thanks. baby. All right, thanks. Hey, uh, Aaron, when Sean Clifford has been healthy this year and he's getting closer to, I think, top physical condition um, against two of the better teams that Penn State played, Wisconsin in the second half and in the Iowa game early before he got hurt, Mike Yersich used tempo. Um, for Penn State to kind of get the offense going in the Wisconsin game and also uh, really had Iowa's defense scrambling before uh, Clifford had to leave that game. They really, they had them, they had them kind of on their heels. They were able to throw the ball. Uh, Penn State was able to pass protect pretty well. It looked like really Penn State might win by double digits before before Clifford got hurt. And I know that in the Michigan State game, uh, Michigan struggled with tempo and substitutions. My question is, do you feel like Michigan is now better equipped to handle maybe a tempo game from Penn State? Because I think it's coming uh, in this game because Penn State throws the ball an awful lot. Better equipped, probably, just just because they've seen it on film. And not only from Michigan State, but they struggled at times against Nebraska. They struggled at times against Rutgers, and that up-tempo offense, and that mobile quarterback that can do a lot of things. Uh, so I, I do think they're better equipped. Now, whether they can handle Sean Clifford in the Penn State office, offense, I think remains to be seen. I, I think there, there's, there are some holes there. Um, they, they had trouble with substitutions, as you mentioned, against Michigan State a few weeks ago. They, they think they, they figured that out last week. Um, but you know, it, 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 we'll see, uh, you know, I, I don't have the answer to that. And I think it's going to be an interesting kind of storyline to watch on Saturday. Um, keep in mind, they've got a first year coordinator, defensive coordinator, Mike McDonald from, he came from the NFL, the Baltimore Ravens. Um, sure. he's very much changed the way they play defensively. It's not entirely different from what Don Brown was running before. Um, but they're showing more disguising, more blitzing, more, they're doing more versatile things. Uh, and it's been a very, very more multiple defense. I think it's had it's it's kept offenses kind of on their toes because I, I don't think they necessarily know what to expect. Uh, but no, I mean, the jury's out of Michigan's defense and whether they can handle Temple. I mean, they struggled, like I said, they struggled with Michigan State. Um, they struggled in the second half of Nebraska. So I, I'm really curious to see how they come out on Saturday, because if they can't handle it, I think Michigan wins this game. If not, uh, there's there's a very likely possibility that Penn State, you know, comes out with the victory. You're up, Davey. Um, the Michigan State game, Aaron, um, a lot of coaches are doing this now. They're, they're entering the change-up quarterback if they have one. Um, and usually he runs a couple of plays and then leaves. Um, J.J. McCarthy is that guy for Gaddis and Harbaugh. In the Michigan State game, I thought it was really intrusive. He did throw for a touchdown early. But then he he was put into the game for a very tough spot. I don't care if he's a four or five star recruit, a very tough spot in a tight game, uh, in a crazy game um, on the road. And he fumbled not once, but twice. Is that going to affect? I mean, I don't really count the Indiana game as as. Uh, instructive of whether he's going to do this is 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 is, is that going to affect whether he does that against Penn State? I I don't know. It, it seems like they've kind of been full speed ahead with kind of how they're working using the quarterbacks. Um, you know, one of those fumbles. I don't think Michigan is necessarily blaming JJ. It was on a handoff to the running back, and I think it was kind of a mutual thing. Uh, I thought the snap was fine, and the 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 the, the you know handoff was fine. It was partly on the running back. Um, but the way they've used McCarthy and McNamara have been interesting because from the get go, from the spring, they named you know McNamara the starting quarterback, and I think to the fan. The, the Michigan fan, I think some folks were disappointed because everyone's wanted to see J.J. McCarthy, the five-star. Yeah, well, that's know. always the problem with Michigan fans. They always <laughs> think the next the next guy is going to be the guy. You know, they, yeah. they can't 
They can't have just a, what about just a competent game manager? And McNamara was much more than that against Michigan State. He was having a career game. And all of a sudden you, you throw J.J. McCarthy in there in the fourth quarter. Why? I mean, you know, I just didn't understand it. There was a reason. Uh, Cade was in the medical tent at that point. I don't know if they, the Michigan staff, they were hesitant about putting him back in the game. He was he was injured to some degree. Now, that being said, Cade ended up going back into he the came game back the in. following yeah. drive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there was, I think, the feeling there. But you're right. I mean, I think there was some head scratching, head scratching there, especially after, you know, J.J. was involved in that first fumble. Why put him in again? Um, it, it's kind of counterintuitive in a way because, like, as I mentioned, the, the, the fans have been clamoring to see more of J.J. They've been asking, well, why don't you throw J.J. in more? And you saw what happened in those big spots. I mean, he's you got to remember, he's still a freshman. He's still going to mess kid. up. Yeah. yeah well, I think we all know st- why, why these coaches do it. They don't want to lose the recruit because mm-hmm. if they don't play him a little bit, they're out the, they're out the portal. So that's, that's probably it. Go ahead, Bob. It's the Blue White Breakdown Podcast. Bob Flounders and Dave Jones with our special guest, Aaron McCann of MLive.com. Aaron, it's, I, I get it that you think that how, how Michigan's defense handles Penn State's tempo is going to be a huge key to the game. I couldn't agree more. To me, I just – I've watched – I have watched Penn State struggle with uh, talented edge rushers in in spots this year, and I'm I think Penn State should be very concerned about Michigan's two edge rushers, Aiden Hutchinson and David Ajabo, um, especially the right tackle, Caden Wallace. I've seen him really get beat by some athletic edge rushers. Can you can you just talk a little bit about those two guys? I don't I remember Hutchinson. Uh, a li- uh, you know, going into the year, but I don't remember much about Ojabo. And uh, ha- has Ojabo's, I guess, success surprised you? Because he's really put up some phenomenal numbers, and he was he was actually pretty dominant in that Michigan State game when Michigan State tried to throw the ball. When they ran it, there wasn't much he could do about it. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I think Ajabo has been the biggest surprise in the Michigan defense th- this year. You know, I think we all knew what Aiden Hutchinson was capable of. You know, he put up numbers before he was coming back for his final year. He was a preseason All-American by, by several outlets. So I think the product, everyone knew the production was going to be there. But, you know, uh, teams having to double him up and, and slide up for protection up to, to block him, I think it opened things up for Ajabo on the other side. Um, he, and he's, he's answered the bell. I mean, he's, he's this quick guy who's, I think he's, he's got a fascinating story. You know, we've written about it on live.com in the past, but like, you know, he, he growing up, he grew up in Scotland. Uh, that wasn't familiar with the game of football much at all. He moved to the U S intending to play soccer and run track. And he just found football. He was this big, talented, speedy guy that, you know, his, his coach kind of figured, well, we'll throw him in there and see what he does. And he's, he's kind of only grown. And, and since he's been in the Michigan offense or defense, you know, he recruited Ann Arbor to be that type of bull rusher, kind of like Aiden Hutchinson, but he hadn't played a ton. I mean, if you go back to last year, he played in bits and pieces. He had, he got a few snaps here and there, but wasn't that, that, that dominating guy that you're seeing this year, this year has yeah. been a total different story. And I think part of that is the scheme Michigan's, you know, defense is playing with, uh, they're doing a lot of odd man fronts, just a lot of different things are throwing at opposing offenses, and it's opened things up for uh, for Ajabo. I mean, Hutchinson's gotten his production as as expected, but Ajabo's so far at least eclipsed him. So he's certainly been the biggest surprise. It's in it's given Michigan's defense um, just an added weapon. I mean, it, it, teams not only have to game plan for Hutchinson now, but they have a game plan for Ajabo. And they've got an experience, a experienced, better interior defensive line um, mm-hmm. than compared in previous years. So I, I think it's one of the reasons why Michigan defense has been so productive so far. Aaron, strange dynamic for this game. Um, I think it's probably a linchpin for Penn State only in James Franklin's marketability. While it's really, you know, their season's kind of shot with three losses. Their best case is probably the Citrus Bowl if they went out. Uh, while Michigan, this is this is a real opportunity. This is a linchpin for their season. They get by this. I mean, all they have is Maryland, which is going to be a pushover for them. For they're going to bully ball Maryland all over the field. And then I think they have a real shot for the first time in quite a while against a flawed Ohio State team and not really a very tough Ohio State team at scrimmage. What is the tenor? of Michigan fans who are constantly hopeful and yet have constantly seen their dreams dashed during Charlie the Brown. Har- <laughs> <laughs> That's really I, good, Bob. That's actually it. During the Harbaugh era. I'll, I'll use a phrase I use every year, no matter expectation or anything, cautiously optimistic. You know, I, I think, <laughs> like, like you said, I think there's a, those fans that keep coming back and watch this program in and out every week, and they keep waiting for them to get over the hill and, 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 and do something. 
Uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because before the season even started, I think Michigan's prognostications, the, the win totals were like seven, seven and a half wins. Yeah. Um, I, you know, before the year, the year even started, when I did my predictions, I, I counted the Wisconsin game as an automatic loss. I counted Penn State as an automatic loss. And, and Penn State, obviously, end of the year. Part of the reason was Michigan has struggled on the road, you know, obviously at Penn State and Wisconsin. Well, they showed that they can go on the road and, and beat Wisconsin. Um, you know, they, they, they obviously lost to Michigan State a couple weeks ago, but I, I think there's this renewed optimism that Michigan can win on the road. They can win these big games on the road. So I, I think, I, I think there, there's some folks here in, in Ann Arbor that think they can win this game. I, I, you know, the odds makers certainly think so at this point. Um, it, it's going to tell us a lot. You know, we, we learned a lot after the Wisconsin game, but going on the road and beating Penn State, obviously they're not what they've been the last couple of years, but uh, it, it would go a long way. And, and I think um, helping the fan base, um, you know, with expectations, because you're right. I mean, they're, they're going to beat Maryland. I think there's no doubt about it. And at the end of the year, as I think many of us you know, have come to realize, it's going to come down to that Ohio State game. In, they, in week they, need, they, need, they need an analyst. They need a group analyst. They need a 12-step program. <laughs> uh, I, I, would, I would add that I think this is a very different Wisconsin team right now if they play them in Indianapolis, say, than the, the one they played, uh, and mainly because of Braylon Allen. Go ahead, Bob. Aaron, so I know that when, when Harbaugh uh, got to Michigan, one of, the, one of the things he did, and it was viewed as a signature hire, was, uh, you know, the defensive coordinator, Don Brown. And it just seemed like as time went on uh, at Michigan, uh, his act grew a little bit stale, maybe from a scheme standpoint. And it would always kind of show up, I think, more and more in the Ohio State game. But then it just kind of got a little bit worse and worse. Now that, now that McDonald uh, is in place, what would you say or maybe one or two things that he's been able to do that's kind of or, or maybe that are different with his defense than, you know, Don's last couple of defenses? Yeah, he's accentuating the positives and hiding the negatives. You know, under Don Brown, Michigan was very much line them up and play. We're going to play this one way and we're going to try and outplay you. Now, that worked against the bottom half of the Big Ten. Uh, they they pile up wins against the Maryland's and the Indiana's and, and the likes and everything else. But when it got to the big games, as you guys have seen, you know, in state college, particularly on the road, whether it was Penn State, Ohio State, they would they would often struggle. And it was because the other teams had better players and or knew how Michigan was going to was going to play uh, with, with Mike McDonald's changed a little bit. You know, as I mentioned earlier, they're not afraid to go with three, four man fronts and change it up. Um, they're highlighting their outside linebackers. Aiden Hutchinson is, is, is playing a little bit different role this year as kind of a stand-up outside edge guy as yeah. opposed to in the past where he was kind of on his, on his, you know, on his hands in, in a traditional set, uh, stance at, at the end. Um, not only that, but they've got other playmakers playing in different positions. Perfect example, uh, their safety, Daxton Hill. He traditionally was a, a traditional you know, uh, safety, not you know, one or two high-man coverage, yeah. whereas the last this season they're kind of putting him more at the line of scrimmage, threatening with blitz with him. Or dropping them back in in in, in coverage, so they're they're utilizing him a little bit more. Um, they have they've kind of gone away with the gone away from their traditional viper position, um, and th so they're, they're utilizing the linebackers a little bit differently. Um, they're putting they're not afraid to change it up up front, and they haven't been afraid to go go with, go with zone coverage uh, in in the past game. That was something Don Brown didn't do a right. ton. Uh, it was very much man on man. Uh, they, the corners are off to the left on an island. And as you saw, particularly last year, it kind of blew up on them. You know, Michigan State threw for a ton of yards. Indiana threw for a ton of yards. Uh, and it, it became apparent at that point that not only had the talent started receding, um, but opponents knew how Michigan was going to play. And, and they exploited that. And, and that's one of the reasons why you saw the, all the, the coaching staff changes in the offseason. Aaron, I think um, most people probably agree this game is going to be one in scrimmage, simply because of, because of all the reasons we talked about with the, the way Harbaugh is in big games, he kind of sphincters up and he's going to try to win it that way. But there will be opportunities for play action passing for McNamara. He's proven pretty competent that way. Um, is there a game manager type of, you know, when Ronnie Bell got hurt, uh, they thought there, there really wasn't a go-to guy. Now, Mike Sainer still, who is, was, I think he was down the depth chart, right? He has become a, a, a kind of a big play guy. Is there, is there a, a possession receiver, maybe a tight end, anybody else who can be that guy when they need to complete a pass uh, simply to, to keep a drive going. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the play action stuff because Michigan's utilized it a ton the last couple of weeks with the tight ends. Uh, Eric All has, has it's truly been turned into that guy where if Cade McNamara can't find a receiver down, downfield, he hits Eric All over the middle. 
Uh, Eric Hall did not play last week. He was injured. Uh, so the assumption is, is he's going to play Saturday. We haven't got definitive word again on it. Uh, but Michigan hasn't been afraid to use the tight ends. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Harbaugh kind of re- you know, relying on his old his old uh, schemes. You know, he, Jeremy yeah. Tooman. Where's yeah. Jeremy Tooman? Jim Mandich. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> So it, not not only did they, did they use Eric Hall, but they've been in, um, you know slowly kind of um, you know bringing on Luke Schoonmaker. He was a big, he had a big game last week as well. Yeah. So they're not afraid to use the tight ends. They will do it. Uh, K. McNamara, I think that's more in his wheelhouse anyway. He doesn't have the strongest arm in the world, and you haven't seen them take a ton of deep shots on the field as a result. So they've had to rely on the short intermediate game. And that's where some of those possession receivers, Cornelius Johnson is another receiver who's kind of yeah. come on the last few weeks. He, he had over 100 yards receiving last Saturday. Um, but yeah, tight ends are, are going to be a big part of the game on Saturday. Michigan's do, do, utilizing do the tight ends. Do the tight ends still have giant shoulder pads like they do in the '90s? No, I'm just kidding. Um, remember, remember those guys? There was oh, shoulder pads out there. Neck yeah. rolls too. Yeah, yeah neck, neck rolls, rolls, neck rolls. Aaron, I have I have just one more for me, and it's a little it's a little bit general, but I'm always fascinated. I know the fan base is fascinated. Dave Jones is a little bit fascinated. What is it like? Uh, just just covering a, a Jim Harbaugh team. What is he like? Do you, are you enjoying it? Have you, have you kind of learned to kind of read some of the things he says and interpret them maybe a little bit differently, kind of try to decode them? Because you have some of the same kind of issues with James Franklin. Yeah, you nailed it. You got to decode what Jim Harbaugh says because he doesn't say much. Right? Right. And you can try and you can try and you can try. And you, you, you learn quickly that Jim Harbaugh is only going to talk about what Jim Harbaugh wants to talk yeah. about. And anything else, it, it, he'll he'll deflect. He'll he'll you know ask you know he'll you'll, you'll ask a question and he'll turn it into a response about t- something totally different. Sure. Uh, so that that's just how it goes with him. Uh, I found that often the the most like basic questions sometimes will turn him out. Like he'll he'll and then he'll give you a story about some other time or his playing yeah. days or the like. So he he's a fascinating character. And it, it, it's been fascinating to watch from the very beginning to now because when he first got to Ann Arbor. Anything he said was, you know, with the fan base, like, you yeah. know, they, they paid attention to, they, they, they talked about, they read, and now it's not so much. I mean, I think part of that is, is the losing the inability to get to the big 10 title game. And I, so I, I think in a way his, his act has sort of started to wear thin, but at the same token, I think Michigan fans also realize like this guy isn't a total failure. He's not like a Scott Frost where he's not, you know, he's only winning three or four games a year. You <laughs> did know? you hear that Bob? Not a total failure it. like Scott Frost. Here. So, and that's, and that's all, and that's always the, the dilemma. Like, you know, does, if Michigan does move on from Jim Harbaugh, I'm not suggesting they will or plan to, but like, you know, can you find someone else that's going to come in here and win eight, nine, 10 games every year consistently? And, that, and that's what he's done. And the issue, and, and as I mentioned earlier, is getting over that hump and getting in the big 10 title game. It, it's, it's there for the taking this year. They've got, they've obviously got to win out and that starts Saturday against the Nittany Lions. Uh, but they've also need, to, need some help as well uh, in the form of losses from, from Michigan state. Did you, you ever pick a fight with him, Aaron, just for the hell of it? <laughs> like, I don't, like, I oh, never really have. He says something obtuse and you say, what's that supposed to mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot of that. It's like <laughs> you kind of like roll your eyes or, you know, you give him, you give him the stare or anything. But, yeah, it's <laughs> it, you're in a no-win situation from Jim. I, I've learned it, it doesn't really matter what he says. It's, it's <laughs> I roll, you know. Aaron, this is usually the, situ- this is usually the time in the uh, in the podcast where Dave and I kind of give our prediction scores, maybe key to the game. I don't know if you're comfortable doing that. I don't know what you guys do at M live, um, but if, whether he's comfortable, he's got to do it. That's he, that. <laughs> if you like, have I, a thought or two, uh, please share it with us. I'm dying to know what you think about this game. Yeah. I already sent my prediction in, but I'll, I'll give you guys it. I, I think it's going to be, a, it's going to be a close game either way. I, I think sure. these two are very, very similar teams uh, just from a talent perspective. Uh, I, I think certainly Penn state's probably got the, the edge with the quarterback and maybe the receivers, um, but you're right. You know, as you guys mentioned, I think this game is going to be one up front. I think if Michigan can establish the run and move the football early on, because you keep, remember, Michigan hasn't, uh, they've only trailed twice all season long. They've scored first in every single game they've played in. So they haven't really been punched in the mouth yet for, from the start. I keep waiting on a team to do it and haven't done it. Uh, so yeah, I don't know if it's going to be really, this. Yeah. So I'm really curious to see how, how that goes. Uh, if Michigan can score first and control the clock and run the football fine. I think they're going to win the game. I mean, that's just but their MO. That's what they've been successful doing all season long. Um, if, if they can't do that, they struggle and they're forced to throw the ball and Penn State can move and, and, and get some of those bigger plays. I, I think Penn State can win. So I, I think it's, going, it's probably going to go down the wire. It's probably going to be a one-possession game either way. 
Um, I did pick Michigan to win, I think, by a field goal. I think I had 27, 24 or something. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it's kind of been the case, you know, all season long. It, it's, it, I, don't, I don't think Michigan has – they haven't dominated too many teams, especially these, these better Big Ten teams. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll see. I, I think it's, it's going to be a, a very – another telltale sign of where this Michigan program is and whether they're, you know, playoff contenders or not. All right, Dave, you're up. I'm picking uh, Michigan by the 2015 score, uh, which was 2016. Very good, Bob. Very good. That was uh, that was the the day that Harbaugh picked the fight of me with me. <laughs> Woody Hayes never said that. You just died to pick a fight with Woody him. Hayes. You're going to go down to that locker room after. I was game. complimenting the guy. You know, you got your team up. Or Woody Hayes never said that. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I, I I grew up in Columbus, and he did. But and I'm older than you. But okay. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I tend to think <laughs> that Penn State's front has not, what, what are we going to go back to maybe Auburn since, um, uh, Penn State's defensive front has faced a, uh, a, a, a the, t- the type of offense like this. Is that accurate, Bob? I don't know. I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah. I mean, they, I, I think that the, the worry against Ohio State was the quarterback could sling it and the, the freshman running back, they kind of, they could get you either way, was the thought coming in. And that wasn't the thought against all no. the running back. And Iowa was yeah. just inept. So go ahead. Yeah. I, I, I don't think Ohio State's offensive line is as good as it's as cracked up to be. And Penn State stopped them. Uh, except for a couple of bust out plays by Travion Henderson. Yeah. This is going to be a grinded out game if Harbaugh can possibly make it that way. And I think we're going to know pretty quickly uh, whether Michigan can own scrimmage on offense. I think that's the game. If they can do it, man, it's gonna, it could be a long day. So that's, that's my pick. Uh, I could be completely wrong because Penn State's front has shown yeah. at times they're really stout. And if they do what they did against Ohio State, it's a completely different game. So we have to guess on that. I'm going to guess that that Penn State's front hasn't come up against a a, a front quite like this um, on offense. So I'm I'm picking Michigan 28-16. Aaron, before I make my pick, I just want to, because Dave and I talked about it on, on the previous podcast a little bit. You know, when Illinois ran for 357 yards, they used a set with seven offensive linemen and two tight ends. And the two teams that Penn State's faced since then, um, you know, didn't do it. Maryland didn't do it. Ohio State didn't do it. Does Michigan uh, do a lot of jumbo sets? Do they have enough talent up front to go with extra big personnel? Because if that, that would probably work against the Penn State defensive line that doesn't have their best defensive tackle in P.J. Mustafa. Yeah, they, they did it against Indiana, didn't they, Aaron? Yeah, they've done it several times this year. They, they, and they really think they've got six or seven starters up front, and they haven't been afraid to go with two tight end sets. So, yeah, they will, they, they will absolutely – they are absolutely capable of doing it. I suspect they probably will, especially if they're trying to control the – Illinois – Illinois did what it wanted for long stretches with, and they were 24 point underdogs and they just had, they just had a quarterback and a running back and everyone else was blocking and Penn state really never adjusted. Franklin said they feel like they've adjusted, but they haven't seen it since the Illinois game. I just don't know what happens if, if, if Harbaugh and Michigan does that, I'm going to say 23, 20 Michigan. I think, I think it'll be a really vicious, hard fought game. I have taken note that uh, Michigan's probably got one of the best, place kickers in the country and the moody kid and you know as good a punter as jordan stout is as a field goal kicker from 40 plus he's very dicey i i think it's a three-point game i'm going to say michigan is going to take it 23 20 i'll be dying to see if we see that big jumbo formation again yeah i probably i probably should have made a four field goal game for jake moody because that's like every day right every, every <laughs> Saturday. so let's let's make mine 26 16 i haven't sent my pick in yet so i can change it all right. Hey, Aaron McCann of MLive.com. Thanks so much for joining us, Bob Flanders and Dave Jones, on the Blue White Breakdown podcast, a, pod- a podcast all about Penn State football from Penn Live. Aaron, I'm looking forward to talking to you later this week. We'll see you at the game. Hopefully, it'll be everything we expect it to be, and we'll see Dave Jones confront Jim Harbaugh and Nika. <laughs> In the post-game I'm looking interview, forward to that. Visiting interview. Hopefully we'll get to see that. Make sure you have your, your camera ready. That's the angry, say. the angry, indignant Jim Harbaugh after a win. You know, that's <laughs> yeah. um, um, Aaron, you, you were good. You were fine. You did you did good, kid. You're, you're gonna be <laughs> I okay. I appreciate that.
<laughs> All right, that's it, guys. Thanks a lot.